Hello, everybody, and welcome to Limited Level Ups. I'm Alex, and this week's episode is a Lord of the Rings draft metagame update. So, last week, at the end of last week's episode, I had said that this episode today was going to be a gameplay-focused episode. But, now that the format has experienced its first big metagame shift, I think there's still a ton to talk about in just the draft and deck building alone. Often I plan my episodes so that what I talk about mirrors where I see people struggling in a given format, whether that be... You know, I'm, I'm in a coaching session or in my Twitch chat or I'm talking to people in the Limited Level Ups Discord. And while the gameplay in this format is complex and textured and it's definitely still going to get its own episode, don't worry, we're not skipping that. I've seen a lot of people flounder in just the draft portion in the past week and a half now that that metagame shift has happened. Because, it, you know, it's almost like you have to learn a format again to some degree. Often for the gameplay episodes that I do for every format, I'll mention that we've kind of gotten to the point in the format where somebody will send me their... 17 lands, draft, and gameplay logs. I'll take a look at both of them. And 80%, 90% of the time, it, the problem there is, hey, like, there's there's some issues with the gameplay. Let's try to work on that. But right now, I actually found it's about a 50-50 split, if not leaning a little more towards where I would see the biggest improvements is if people cleaned up their draft a little bit. I guess another way to put this is that there's enough people I've seen that they can't even focus on the good gameplay because there's problems in the draft that you have to address first, right? No matter how good your gameplay is, you gotta have that foundation of a good deck to be able to compete. So that's what we're in for today. I'm gonna be painting a picture of what I think the format looks like right now, but also what to do with that information. So after I touch on that metagame update, well, what the format looks like, I also wanna cover some thoughts on draft navigation, uh, I want to do a closer look, a bit of a deep dive on the non-red-black decks of the format, some of the ones that I think are more important to touch on. And we're going to finish off on some notable cards that have gone up for me in the past week or two that might not be on people's radars just yet. And as always, got to give a quick shout-out to the Patreon before I jump in. Patreon.com slash LivingLevelUps. Shout-out to everybody who supports over there every single week. Really helps the show keep on moving. If you feel like you've learned something, you've gotten something in the show, you just want to give back in some way, Go check that Patreon out, patreon.com slash limitlovelups. The best way you can support any of my content, the stream, the podcast, the articles, any of that good stuff, go check that out. All right, let's jump in. So if you were with us for the last format, March of the Machine, on one of the later episodes of that format, I mentioned that I wanted to try to address metagame shifts on the podcast when they happen. Basically, just to keep you as informed as you can be, formats change, so you should change the way that you approach them, and specifically... There are a lot of people who I think their trajectory with any format, with most formats, goes something along the lines of, well, I was doing pretty well in the first two weeks, and then people figured out what the good cards were, and then I stopped doing so well. It's a very typical thing. It happens to everybody. You just need to recognize when it happens and then adjust in the right ways so you can keep on winning. And by the way, just to be clear on the idea of a metagame shift, a metagame shift happens when people, or the, you know, the arena draft population, starts to value cards differently than they did before in kind of a systematic manner. And this happens every single format at least one time, usually not more than once or twice, but at very least there will be one dramatic shift. And that most dramatic meta shift you'll experience in any format happens about two weeks in, and it's always going to happen. This is the shift that happens when people start to understand what the good cards are, uh, and they start to draft them earlier. Also, you know, people start to realize that the bad cards maybe aren't so good, they, they draft those lower, so they realize, hey, that Mirkwood Bats isn't actually that good. This is also, that two-week in mark, is when quick draft starts. And so you have a lot of the newer drafters migrating over there. So drafts do get harder, quote-unquote harder in a way, because you're not just wheeling Dunlane Crabanes and Rally the Hornbergs and stuff like that. People are going to take those good cards, and if you're not adjusting to that, that's going to be a problem. So yeah, this initial shift happens, quick draft starts, uh, just, you know, general casual players might stop drafting after a few times, the, the big podcasts come out with their information, so just more information is disseminated, there's 17 lands, of course, you can look at for some of that information, and when that shift happens... It's generally a good thing for your win rate if you can adjust accordingly, but you might be a victim of this, right? If you're not aware of that metagame shift happening or you're trying to adjust in the wrong way somehow. Because if you think about it, a metagame shift is just more information for you to work with, right? Especially, I'm mostly talking to this uh, initial metagame shift that happens every single format, but when people stop drafting just you know whatever like they were in the first week they're almost taking random cards seemingly random cards sometimes and the the whole draft population now has this knowledge to work with people are drafting in a more predictable manner and there's some structure and some order to how people draft and so you can 
not quite exploit that. I, I think there, there's definitely some formats where it's like, oh, nobody's drafting this deck. I can, I can really, uh, you know, draft this deck that nobody's drafting. I don't think it happens most formats, but having that knowledge of where people take certain cards or certain colors of cards or cards for certain archetypes definitely helps to inform your drafts after that week two going forward. So with any metagame shift, there's there's two things to consider. The the when and the what. Well, the when we kind of already covered uh, as that, that first two week shift. And sometimes, like I mentioned before, it does happen in additional time. It's rare these days that the format will shift like two, three, four times. You got that a lot more back before uh, 17 lands was a thing. And back before there was more content where people would kind of figure out the format slower and be like, oh yeah, this, you know, this red blue deck that uh, nobody was drafting. Somebody figures that out. And then more people through just word of mouth, figure that out. You know, they go to their local game store. Now that stuff's kind of just like on, on 17 lands and there's enough content where there's no really hidden deck by week three generally, but sometimes it does happen. Sometimes there's a, a format that is deep enough, complex enough. The formats like Call Time and Strixhaven, Aquaria, you know, the real deep ones, the, the Dave Humphrey formats generally, they can definitely have some churn, but for uh, the majority of formats, it, it is that really that one time. So that, that's the when of it. And of course, if there does happen to be a format where this happened multiple times, you can hopefully turn to this podcast to uh, to figure that out. The what part of this metagame equation is a little bit trickier because it's unique for each format. And unless there's a podcast like this one that you're listening to, there's no just quick and dirty answer. And so to find that what, what has happened in the mid game, what's happening here, there's a few things you can do. Number one, draft a lot. The people who draft, you know, three, four, five times a day, they have a pretty good intuition of this where people go, okay, well, you know, now the black cards are going a little bit earlier. Maybe the blue cards are underrated. You kind of get that sense. Your brain picks up on that subconsciously, I think. But if you're somebody who drafts, you know, once, twice a week, it's going to be a little harder than that. So you can, number one, Find somebody that you trust who drafts a lot to kind of spread that information with you. Or if you want to go out on your own and try to do this, there is a tool on 17 lands called the card metagame evaluation tool that actually does help for this. So just to show you quickly here, and for those listening, I'll I'll try to narrate what I'm doing here. I've gone to 17lands.com. You go to the top toolbar there. You go to analytics. You go to card uh, evaluation metagame, and it'll give you this graph. And the graph has two axes. One is average last seen at, which is on average where that card, whatever card it is uh, you're looking at, where that gets taken in the draft. That's the Y axis. And then the X axis, that uh, tells you the date. So you've got from, on this one in particular, we're looking at Lord of the Rings. The dates go from uh, June 20th to July the 7th. And like a few, you know, every two days in between, it'll give you a data point. And basically what you can do with this graph, you can filter by color, you can filter by common, uncommon. You can see where people are taking cards and, and how cards are going earlier and earlier. Good cards going earlier and earlier, not so great cards going later and later. So for example, Claim the Precious. I mean, that's a good card. One and two, one black, black, destroy a creature, the ring tempts you. That started high and it's gone even higher. And if you just look at all of black's commons, aside from maybe one or two, they're all just this trajectory of up, up, up. So people are taking these cards higher. Same thing goes with red. Not quite to the same degree as the black cards, but they are going up, up, up. Uh, they're also being pretty highly rated. And you go to green, you see the opposite. The green cards are trending down. So basically, this just says 70 lands users have sussed out one way or another that black and red are quite good and green is not so good. And that tool is pretty helpful because not only does it show you, you know, what you'd expect out of a metagame shift sometimes, like in this format, for example, where, yeah, black and red are great. People are taking those cards highly. Green is not so good. People are not taking those cards very highly. You would expect that from the first big metagame shift. But sometimes the perception of what the good cards are doesn't line up with what the actual good cards in the format are. So for example, in, in Midnight Hunt, in Estride Midnight Hunt, I always use this example because it's such a poignant one. If you remember that format, that's the format that Blue Black Zombies and Blue White Disturbed were the two best decks and Blue being the common denominator there. And you would expect after the first metagame shift that the blue cards would be taken very, very highly. Maybe it's harder to get into one of these decks, but that wasn't quite the case. I had actually found that the blue cards were still not being taken as highly as they should have been. You had stuff like Larder Zombie and Revenge of the Drown and Flip the Switch. These cards were still coming to you quite late. So whereas in some formats where that metagame shift happens, you go, okay, well, people are drafting the good cards now. I need to know about that. I need to adjust. I can't just always count on having good red-black deck in Lord of the Rings, for example. 
And that form of the information I got was, oh, I should just keep on drafting what I'm drafting because people still aren't taking the good cards. And so that information is also valuable too. Not just to be like, oh, I'm going to zig when they zag, right? Because yeah, that's, that's definitely an appealing part of this information. But also the information of, oh, people just aren't zigging, so I don't need to zag. And I've talked about this a little bit before, but that mostly happens when blue is the best color or one of the better colors. I believe that the average arena drafter just has a difficult time understanding and evaluating what makes a good blue card a good blue card. You no, know, good counter spells tend to be underrated. Cards that put creatures on top of their owner's libraries, those tend to be pretty underrated. Something like Deceive the Messenger, like the from Lord of the Rings, the single blue mana, something that's negative three, negative O, and you amass one. That card's quite good. I'm happy to play a few copies of that. I don't think the average drafter looks at that card and goes, oh yeah, Deceive the Messenger, get that card in my deck. I think people look at that card and like, I don't know if that card's good, <laughs> you know? So this is mostly just to say that, you know, the metagame isn't exactly going to pan out how you might expect it to. You can still get your money by drafting the good cards, getting the good decks in some formats where people might not catch on as fast as in some other ones. Okay, so let's apply all this metagame talk to the current format, to Lord of the Rings. I kind of want to take a look at sort of the story of the format so far, what's happened on week one, how that's shifted on week two, and what that means for you as the drafter. I think the best way to paint a picture of the format is to talk about um, color and archetype strength and how they've changed. So let's do that. Week one, the clear best deck in the format was red, black. Red and black have the strongest cards. They're the deepest colors. And since a lot of the good red and black cards were undervalued by people not in the know, uh, drafters who were in the know could get good red, black decks almost every draft, honestly. Like you could soft force the deck if you really wanted to. And you'll often see this on week one, actually, in, in most formats. There, there will be a clear best deck in the format like if you just look on 17 lands there's like one standout and if you're paying attention to what that deck is you can often get your money in the first week just by soft forcing that deck and when i say soft force i basically mean going to the draft assuming you're going to draft it until clear it's clear absolutely clear that you can't do that maybe somebody else next to you is trying to do the same thing like i'm gonna go back to midnight hunt again this happened with blue black zombies both me and lsv week one of the format we just were going into drafts being like, yeah, I'm just going to be drafting blue black because people aren't taking the good blue black cards. And you, we forced it to high mythic, basically. Right? I, think, I think both of us hit mythic number one at some point doing that strategy. You know, sometimes the, the best deck in the format isn't going to be as pronounced as it is in Lord of the Rings or it was in Midnight Hunt or something like AFR, Adventures of the Forgotten Realms with red black sacrifice. But even still, in almost every format, if you do catch wind of that best deck, I, I would honestly just, you know, if you, if you don't value the variety of exploring the format week one and your goal is truly just to win, I, I think you should go into drafts assuming you're going to draft that deck. And that's what I was doing for red, black in week one. And, you know, it, it worked out pretty well. I was winning quite a bit in the first few days of the format. And then you move to our tier two colors in white and blue. And those were good colors, just not as deep as red or black. Week one... If you would ask me which of these two colors, blue or white, were better, I would have said white. But now I actually do think it is quite clearly blue as the third best color in the set. And we're going to get into that in a second here. But just a, a definite notable shift to me that I value the blue cards quite a bit higher than the white ones. And yeah, thoughts on that in just one minute. And then the last part of week one here, you have green, of course. And if you asked me last week, I would say green sucks. You shouldn't draft green. You should try your very best to not get into this color or not get tricked into drafting it because there's some green cards you see late. They're, they're just not worth it. And I did believe that on week one. I think on week one, that was good advice to give people. But spoiler alert, I do think green is now a draftable color in week two. So that's another thing we'll just touch on in just a minute here. So yeah, that's kind of the story of week one. Red, black are S tier colors. Blue and white are kind of in the middle and green is like tier five, basically. But here's where you have to really be careful and your mental model of what happens when you open a pack and are trying to navigate a draft should start to change because the danger in getting stuck in this week one mindset is your eyes when you open a new pack they kind of gloss over the not so good cards or the cards in not so good colors they get drawn to the red and black cards and that's fine for pick one pack one you know most of the time the cards that are red or black are going to be some of the better cards in the pack but once you get to pick four pick five you can kind of get the feeling of, oh, there's no good cards in this pack. But really what your brain's saying is there are no good red or black cards in this pack. And there might be white, blue, or green cards that are, you know, worse certainly than the better commons or uncommons in the set. But you shouldn't look at a pack going at pick four, pick five, where it's very easy to get to that mindset of pick four, pack five, being like, oh, there's nothing I want to take when 
that's probably just indicative of the meta shifting a little bit. People taking the good cards pick one to five, and you're not used to seeing a lack of good cards pick one to five because it's, you know, week one, you just got those cards. So if you continually, draft after draft, are feeling that, you're like, oh man, by pick five, there's just no good cards in this pack. You're correct if your parameters for good cards are, you know, the best cards in the set. But I think if you stay in that mindset for too long, you do kind of close yourself off to other avenues and other good archetypes that might exist in the set. And once things equalize, right, once red-black starts to be drafted a little bit more, sure, maybe blue-black isn't the tier one deck of the format that you want to be drafting, but you could get to pick five of pack one and be like, hey, there's only blue cards here. What happened to my red-black cards? And be cut off of a potential good blue-black deck that you could have had. So this is really just to say on week two of the format, give yourself a good shake. Stop looking at packs through the eyes of a week one draft and keep your eyes out for the, the good cards of other colors and good cards of other archetypes. Now time to address the shift. So what's happened on week two? Well, like I mentioned, the red cards and the black cards are going earlier. The green cards are going much later. So the number one thing that if you had success in week one, you need to take in for week two is you need to be prepared to fight for the red and black cards. You should fight for them. You shouldn't ignore them. Like I know there's some temptation to be like, Oh, you're like, no, red and black are going to be drafted. I, sh I shouldn't take the red and black cards. No, you should still take those. Because, like, a deck with seven or eight red or black cards, plus, you know, whatever your secondary color is, that deck is still going to be a really good deck. That's how good the black and, and the red cards are. It does mean, though, that unlike week one, if you start your draft with a black rare into a good black uncommon, maybe picks three and four, or even good black commons, you're going to notice at pick five, pick six, almost certainly you're going to stop seeing black cards. Now, this doesn't mean that you should stop taking black cards. And in fact, I think that's kind of a trap you might fall into is you go, okay, well, black's just like not open. I should steer into something else. Kind of start second guessing yourself. No, it just means that rightfully so, there are other people at the table drafting the color. The nice thing is, of course, about red and black is that they are so deep that they can probably support three-ish people at a table quite comfortably. You know, each person gets 10-ish good black cards for their deck. That's going to happen. That's going to be okay. So don't immediately be like, oh, I'm going to pick six and there's no black cards. Just be happy with the ones you have, basically, and then go from there. You might move out of the color entirely. That could be true if two other colors are very open. Um, but I, I just, this is one of the main points that I've been telling people when I looked at their draft logs. Don't just auto be like, oh, I have to get out of black now because you're not seeing the cards pick six. That's going to happen almost every single draft. And if you always try to just jump ship at pick six, you're never going to be able to play black anymore. Now, what this does mean is as a drafter of black or red, you need to find your secondary color a little sooner than some other deck might, right? Because that secondary color is most likely going to have to be the lion's share of the cards in your deck, right? Because you're only going to get, like I said, 10 good red or black cards most times. The other color, it is still very important to find what the most open color is at the table so you can have an open color to pair with your black or red cards because those cards, you're not going to get a bunch of black or red cards to fill out your deck with. So once you get to that pick six, don't go, uh oh, no black cards. Instead go, all right, from green, white, and blue, what colors am I seeing? You know, and sometimes you're lucky and, and like red happens to be open or black happens to be open. If you're very lucky, both of them, you don't have to worry about that. But most of your drafts, that's the question you're going to have to ask yourself at pick six. Where is my secondary color? Where What's the most open color at this table at my seat? That's probably the color you want to move into as your base. The other wrinkle in this is because black and red are such deep colors and they're the good colors and people are going to get want to get into them. The phenomenon I was just talking about where you get to pick six or seven and you don't see any good black or red cards. Everybody else at the table, even the ones that started red and black themselves, are going to feel that as well. And what this means is often you have this game of chicken that happens. And once again, you can apply this to most formats. This happened with blue in, in, uh, in the last format, March of the Machine. But what you can do is if everybody's fighting for it in pack one, and especially if you're the one with a really good black start, like let's say your first five picks were just great black cards. And then pick six, pick seven, pick eight, hey, you're it, they're gone. Um, that Again, you should expect for that to happen. And because you might have some people at the table that do panic when they don't see black cards pick six or seven, they're going to move out of it. And what happens is in pack three, black or red happens to be open once again because everybody else is like, oh, I got to move out of it. And you, if you're riding that black or red train and you started particularly strong and deep under those colors, you should have a good degree of confidence that you'll see good cards in those colors in pack three. 
Now, it's still important, again, to make sure you find a secondary color so that you don't train wreck. Like, I'm hoping to get, you know, pack three is coming. I'm hoping to get paid off with black and red. Uh, they're they're going to be open because everybody tried, everybody was scared off of in pack one. Sometimes that still doesn't happen. Sometimes there's somebody else who knows that same thing, and they're they're riding that uh, that train and holding on for dear life and hoping to get paid out in pack three. But let's say this happens, I don't know, 60 or 70% of the time. Well, the 30 or 40% of the time where black or red doesn't happen to reopen back up in pack three, you still need to have a base color of something else so that, once again, you don't train wreck. But I just want to really point out that this is something that happens very often, and you'll often see in pack three being like, oh, how they're... You know, how is there a fourth pick or a fifth pick claim the precious? Well, that's why. Because people got scared off the color in pack one, and you can move into pack three. Also, one point I wanted to touch on relating to the red and the black cards, and this is just something I've been doing. I don't necessarily claim for it to be right. It's just something I've experimented with, something that uh, I've had success with anecdotally for your, quite a few drafts, is early on, pick one, pack one, pick, you know, pick two, pick three. If you have the choice between a red card and a black card, and they're comparable, let's say it's Smite the Deathless versus Torment a Golem, both fantastic commons, I've been taking the red card over the black card with the logic that red is only a touch worse than black as a color overall, but I think its cards are taken enough lower over the black cards that the equation of how late is this card going versus how good is it or just you know the cards in the color on average how late are they going versus how good are those cards in that color i believe the winner of that ev calculation is the red cards not the black cards so again i don't have too much to offer uh stats wise that this claim is correct it's just been something that i've been doing and has worked been working out pretty well all right the next point of this meta shift is green's a playable color it really is i don't think you should be in green that often i think maybe 10 10 to 15 percent of the time less so than the other colors but it has gotten to the point you know i was just talking about that ev calculation where it's like okay how good are the cards versus how highly are they drafted well the green cards aren't atrocious to be honest the, the commons there's like eight commons that i'm fine putting in my deck and they're drafted quite late a lot of the top commons stuff like woes pathfinder many partings generous end you get these cards on the wheel so that's what really makes it a playable color. And this format's a pretty good case study in self-correcting and draft, or just the, the draft format self-correcting. Often I'll have somebody come into my Twitch chat and be like, oh, I thought green was so bad. Why are we playing it? Or, you know, I just talked about taking a red card over a black card. And, and somebody will be like, oh, do we not like the black cards anymore? No, it's it's definitely not that. It's, it's push and pull, right? And because the green cards are so undervalued now, now it's a playable color. I don't think you should have drafted it week one still. And if you did, it was for experimentation purposes, or you just happened to uh, be in a seat where it was extremely open. But I think with some consistency now, green is open enough. You're getting these late good cards, most Pathfinder and Sphere, Generous Ent, Many Partings, for quote unquote free, like very, very late in the draft. That, that makes it so that, yes, you should be drafting green some amount of the time when other people at the table are drafting the other good colors. And another quick aside here, and this is, again, just kind of like a, a feel thing, but after playing with the green cards, the good ones anyways... I feel like green's win rate on 17 lands might actually be a little bit disingenuous to how good, quote unquote, how good the color is. I'm not saying it's awesome, but I feel like it's better. The color is better than the stats might imply because I think a big problem with green is people are just putting the bad green cards in their deck rather than the good ones. Like if you just look at the play rates of the bad green commons, stuff like Mushroom Watchdogs, that's a really good example. Or is the two mana 2-2 two, two that you can sack a food to put a counter on it that card's not good like that card the food synergy can suck going all in you know feeding your food to the dogs that's not a particularly good strategy there's a few other commons like that all the cards that care about scrying like those are not good like if, basically if you just force people to never play the cards that cared about scrying and never play the cards that care about food i believe green's win rate would be higher so if you can put that restriction on yourself just don't put the green cards in your deck that care about scrying care about food necessarily uh, you know, there's some exceptions there, but you know, as, as a whole, I think your win rate with green will be relatively high as long as you're playing the good green cards, which we're going to talk about in a second, and your secondary color, whatever that is, also has good cards in it. So let's jump into those good green commons. There's about eight of them, which is kind of surprising, honestly. I went through this list. I was surprised I could pick out eight green cards. I was like, hey, these are pretty good. Um, the first four, I think, are just generically good. These are going to be good in any green deck. We've got Woe's Pathfinder, which is a two-mana mana dork, and Fury, which is the fight spell. Generous Ent, which is the green land cycler, and Medi Partings, the green sorcery that goes and gets a land. You make a food token. 
all these cards are just good. Like, if you just had a bunch of black cards, you put these green cards in your deck, you'd be pretty happy with that. Like, these are just generically fine magic cards. They don't need to have food synergies. They don't need to have scrying synergies. You're just fine to put these cards in your deck. And especially, I do want to point out Pathfinder. Um, Pathfinder is just good. Like, Pathfinder is a really good common. Being able to accelerate you early, be a threat that your opponent needs to kill on turn six. Like, that's the mark of a good card. A card that's good early and good late. Also, with most Pathfinder and many partings, um, you can be like a splish splashy green deck where you're maybe three colors, four colors, you know, obviously like two colors and a splash is really what I'm talking about here. But I don't think so. I, I thought week one, I was kind of hypothesizing if you're in green, you're doing it to splash. And I don't necessarily feel that way anymore. Like I've had just good two color green black decks, good two color green red decks. Those have been, you know, once again, just good cards. You don't have to really reach out to any synergies. You don't have to be like, oh, I'm playing my green cards because they allow me to play the, the good cards that I picked up in the draft that I, I don't, aren't my base colors, I, I don't think that's necessarily green's function, but uh, it can be, right? If you end up in a spot where it's like, hey, I started with some powerful cards that, that and whatever, you know, I started some good blue card that didn't end up being open. I moved into green black. I'll splash the blue card, whatever it is, right? So um, it's an avenue. It's an opportunity, but it's not just like the only thing green is doing being some splash splash deck. I think these four green cards, plus uncommons and rares, potentially, you put those in your deck. You're going to just be happy. The second tier of green commons here, we've got Enraged Horn and Mirror Mirror Guardian. This is the, the two tempting cards, the 4-5 the Trample and the 4-2 when it dies, it tempts you. These two cards are also pretty generically good. I put them in a separate section just because uh, I think you do need to have some amount of tempting going on. And often when you're in like red green, there's not actually like a ton of tempting. So just noting that these are temp specific cards, about as good as the other green commons I just talked about, but tempting specific cards. Then we've got uh, Bag End Porter and Mirkwood Spider. Mirkwood Spider is the 1 1 Death Touch. Bag End Porter is the 4 mana 4 4. The one it attacks gets plus X plus X for X the number of legendary creatures you control. Spider is a defensive card, so you're going to play this in your green black decks. Maybe your green blue controlly decks that aren't carrying out Scry because you shouldn't be doing the Scry thing. I don't know. So, some deck that wants to slow down the game. That's that's where you're going to play the Spider. And then Bag End Porter, I'm, I'm putting this on like kind of the situational, narrow ish cards. Not that it's a bad card on its own. Like, you could just put this in your deck, but you do kind of want it, want it to be to the point where when you're attacking with it, it's attacking for six, generally. A five isn't too bad either. Um, it's kind of like Mirror Mirror Guardian and Enraged Shorn, where it's a, a card for the temp deck. I mean, your, your green deck can randomly just have legends too. Four, five, six legends. But really, when it says the number of legends you control, that's often talking about uh, how many temp cards you have in your deck. So just noting, these are cards that... I'm fine playing. But of course, this begs the question, where should you be in green? When should you be in green? Why should you be in green? Like, these are cards that you can play and be happy with if you end up there. But like I said, you shouldn't end up there that often. Pretty much, it's when you can't find your second color and you do notice that these cards are coming to you in the wheel, right? Especially the more generically good ones like the Pathfinder, the Fight Spell, Generous End. You're like, okay, like, that's a good opportunity. Like, a good way to put it is playing green and moving in late in pack one is better than waffling for the rest of the draft, hoping you get into one of the better colors, right? I think it is fine to have that as one of your base colors, once again, if you just have these good green comments. I generally don't start in green, but whereas in week one, I was sort of hesitant to first pick Radagast, which is the 2-5 the mythic that uh, draws you cards whenever you cast a creature, essentially. Uh, I will first pick that card, because that card is absurd, and I will be happy to try to get into green if green is open, to play that card. Like, I, I might have on week one been like, oh, I'll take a Tormented Golem over it. I don't think you should really do that anymore. I think Radagast is good enough and green is open enough as long as you're playing the right cards that I don't mind first picking an absurd green card. The thing is, though, that's one of the only true absurd green cards. There's really not that many good green cards, even at higher rarities in the set. Next up, let's talk about Blue's place after the meta shift. So I, I sort of want to hype up Blue as a color and say that I now do think that it is close to as good as red and black now that we're in week two thanks to how late the good blue cards still go once again when you're trying to figure out a color or archetype strength in a somewhat predictable and stable setting like you know after the metal is sort of settled in week two you're weighing how strong the color is in the abstract versus the price you have to pay for those cards which in you know, the price you have to pay is just where they're taken in the draft and let's just say black is a 9 out of 10 color in the abstract. Red is this 8, uh, 8 out of 10. Blue is a 7 out of 10. Well, it, blue moves to like an 8 or a 9 
because it's good cards just don't get drafted. And I imagine this a little bit last week, but it really is true. So Blue's got two standout commons in this set. Birthday Escape, single mana draw card, the ring tempts you. Glorious Scale, the counter spell, counter target creature spell. If that spell was legendary, the ring tempts you. These cards are very good. They are on the level of the top black and red commons. You should draft these highly. You should be happy to put as many card pieces as you can in your deck. But they are taken like two or three picks on average later than the top red and black commons. And again, that should be expected, but that is a point to exploit if you know that these cards are good and people don't want to take them either because they're taking the good red and black cards or once again, people have a tough time figuring out what good blue cards look like. That's a place for you to be able to get some win percentage, get an edge somewhere. So just want to point out these two cards, very, very good cards, Glorious Gale, Birthday Escape, but blue's commons are also quite deep. Just below that, we've got Deceive the Messenger, the single blue mana instant, target creature gets negative three, negative own until on a turn, amass orcs one. Card's great, really, you know, it's kind of like a removal spell slash combat trick for small creatures. Pelagreer Survivor is the one three mana dork, adds mana for spells. This card is key to the blue deck. It's like you're happy to play three, four copies of this in your two drop slot. It's a very good two drop. Adds mana for your spells, is a good ring bearer, blocks the ring bearer. I've won many games with this card. Well, many might be a stretch, but two. Two, two is a lot for this to happen. Where my opponent casts Faramir, blue-white rare Faramir on turn four, and I just have two survivors in play, and I'm like, all right, well, uh, this game is now about you drawing two cards a turn and hoping that you can't kill me as I mill you out, because now you're basically going through uh, five cards a turn, right? So you do kill them pretty quick with this card on a stable board or if they're not pressuring you. And then Lorien Revealed this is the blue land cycler that draws three cards. Card's just good. Like, having a draw three on essentially what is a land uh, is really quite powerful. The next tier down, we've got two interaction spells, Soothing of Smeagol and Isolation of Orthanc. Both pretty good. Um, I take the other cards I mentioned over these cards because they're, you know, they're fine, they're good, but you do get them, I think, even later than some of the other good blue cards. So just want to point out here that blue, like, blue is actively a good color. Blue is in the ranks of red and black for me. You should try to get into blue, look to get into blue, and especially if you start with red or black cards. I was talking about that, that situation where you get to pick six, pick seven, and you you know you don't see any more red and black cards. The blue cards will often be there, and blue pairs very well with both red and black. So good spot to be in the metagame right now. And then talking about white here, just to finish this off, talking about our fifth color, it's had the uh, the inverse effect uh, that blue has had, where its cards are getting taken higher, even though they're actually, I think, not as good in the abstract. So you've still got the two good commons, the, the top two white commons, Protector of Gondor, which is the 3-3 three, three, make a 1-1 one, one token, an Errant Rider of Gondor, the 3 mana 3-2, three, when it ETBs, you draw a card and you put one on, uh, on the bottom of your library if you don't control a legend. Like, these are just good cards. You, you're happy with these. But unlike blue, I actually think these two cards are worse than blue's top two commons, and its roster of commons is a lot less deep. It's a lot shallower. Like, I, I talk about five other blue cards that I like, and there's even a few more that I didn't touch on. Really, past these two, I, I don't love any of the white commons. Like, none of them I'm excited to put in my deck. We're up to common seven in blue. I was excited to put those cards in my deck. Heck, at this point, there's actually more green commons I'm happy to play than white commons. Although, uh, you know, I do think that the good white on commons carry the color, so it is still a bit better than green. But it has the problem where people are now taking the white cards really, really highly. So it's got a, a, a poor calculation of EV when you try to draft white because... There's not as many good white cards going around, and people are taking them higher. So, whereas I thought blue and white were kind of even last week, it's completely changed now that the blue cards just aren't getting taken higher, and the white cards are getting taken quite a bit higher. So, white has dropped off quite a bit for me. All of the white archetypes, aside from maybe, like, black-white. So, uh, I'm not saying white's bad. I I'm just saying don't be uh, that enthused about moving into white. Unless you've got some higher rarity cards, some good uncommon, some good rares. And with some draft navigation talk out of the way, that brings us to our next section, talking about some archetypes. So I touched on some of the archetypes briefly last week. I want to go a little more in depth on some of the archetypes, specifically the ones I've been winning with a lot and the ones that I think people are probably don't have that much experience with, some of the lesser drafted archetypes. Because if you do choose to follow that blueprint for draft, that outline I just talked about, where you start red, black, and then move into one of the appropriate colors that's open, well, you're going to end up in decks like red green or, or green black a lot of the time right some of the decks that aren't drafted that highly i'm sure there's a lot of people who just have never drafted green or red and have drafted this set uh, a good number of times so 
let's talk about some of those decks. The one I want to start with is Blue Red, and I love Blue Red. I think Blue Red is my favorite deck to draft. I think it is the perfect intersection of very powerful and pretty open. Like I mentioned, the blue cards don't get drafted as highly as they should, so the blue archetypes in general are quite open. And Blue Red is a great deck because its themes work, you know, the spell stuff. Like, if you got that stuff, it works, but you also can have a great red-blue deck without any of the spells matter stuff and just be a tempo deck. So if you have Gandalf Sanction or Fire Inscription, Sanction's the blue-red uncommon that deals X damage to target creature or X the number of spells in your grave and then the damage tramples over to their face. And Fire Inscription's the red enchantment, tuna red. When Inscription enters the battlefield, the ring tempts you and then whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Inscription deals two damage to each opponent, which by the way, is a great card and you should take early. Like this is a build around A minus B plus level card. Really, really strong card. I've had a lot of games where my opponent plays it on three and I just go, well, I didn't play a two drop that affected the board and I really needed to because I need to race this thing. And when my th if my first play of the game is a turn three play, I doubt I'm going to be able to. They're just going to kill me. They just have to cast 10 spells, probably fewer because they might have a sanction or some burn or, uh, you know, the flamesmith, the two one that pings when whenever you cast a spell running around. So really, really love Fire Inscription. I think it is a good first pick. You should take it. But even if you don't end up with sanctions or inscriptions, I just like being in blue red because it's got a lot of really good spells. So I have a deck here that this was a 7-0 deck and it doesn't really care about spells aside from I have three Pelliger Survivors, the one three that adds mana. So I get to have, you know, a mana dork for a lot of my spells. But basically what you're doing is you're, you're just kind of playing this tempo game. You're playing some cheap stuff. Battle Scar Goblins even. Like I had, it's not the fan, most fantastic two drops. The two two that when it gets blocked, it pings whatever blocked it. Um, but like it's just sitting there in the two drop slot so that when I cast my Dreadful of the Storm, which is the th three mana blue trick that gives something, turns something into a five five and then the ring tempts you. Or, you know, I've got stuff that, you know, I've deceived the messenger. My, I attacked my twos, they block, I can set up that, I get some value. And then you're just tempting as the game goes on to get in, like, some chip damage. Like, basically, you've gone in chip damage early with just cheap spells, whatever they are, backing it up with the good card, uh, blue card draw, and then getting the final points in with your ring tempting you. And blue red is quite good, actually, at getting to level four of the ring, I found. So often your Pelliger survivors can be your win condition. So you don't really need anything special. If you've got sanctions or inscription, like, those feel like cheating a lot of the time because they are so good, but they're really not that necessary. So, the deck's just not that complicated, really. Like, if you've got the spell synergies, great. And if you don't, you want to prioritize a bunch of cheap cards so you can start, you know, have a good tempo game. But most collections of blue and red cards are going to be pretty good in this format, I would say. And, and that's something to look out for. Then we move on to blue-black. And blue-black isn't all that much different than blue-red. Um, It trades in the burn aspect for a little bit better late game. Um, it's got the Mouth of Soren, of course, which is the five mana three four that ETBs target player mills three, and then you amass Orcs X or X the number of spells in that player's graveyard. Like this is a great uncommon. You're doing a lot of the same things that Blue Red is doing, except you're not again, you're not doing the burn thing, you're more doing um tempting and just playing the good black cards. So a lot of the same things are true. Just pair your good black cards with your good blue cards. And blue red and blue black, the, these have been my favorite decks when I can't get red black, just because you have a lot of the same color cards. And just like Red Black, the synergies work, but the cards are just good on their own. So this is where I would try to be. If all, like, if you only have one draft a week or whatever, I would try to be either Blue Black or Blue Red because they're easy-ish to get into and you don't need to have a specific setup for cards. The cards just kind of work. Next up, we have Green Black. And the first thing I want to say about Green Black is don't be afraid of getting into it. Like, this is an actively good green deck. I'm happy to play the good black cards with the good green cards. You, of course, get the good gold cards, Old Man Willow and Rise of the Witch King. Old Man Willow is the four mana star star creature that grows for your lands. Then when you attack, you can sacrifice something to give a creature negative two, negative two. Rise of the Witch King is the uh, four mana, two black green reanimation spell that you have to sack something. Uh, and then your opponent has to sack something and you reanimate something. Very good with the land cyclers. Green Black is kind of an offshoot, honestly, of like black blue where it's just hey i'm just playing the good cards here the cards just work they just function i don't really need synergies i've actually got a green black deck right now on arena that i'm currently at four wins with and it's kind of what i was describing right you've just got good black cards got like three mordor musters two torments of golem i've got an urukai berserker two trolls of kaza doom and just the good green cards that i outlined before many partings i've got uh two mirror, mirror guardians because i am tempting a decent amount uh, I picked up a Shalob, which is the reason I think I, I trailed into green black. But this is just a good outline. Once again, you're not doing anything special. You just have the good green and black cards. And just in general, in Magic, in limited Magic, you're going to get such a far way 
I, this is my catchphrase at this point, but just play the good cards, right? Just play cards that are solid. They don't have to be anything special, right? To, to borrow from a Reed Duke phrase as well. You don't need anything special to win a game of Magic. You just need to be playing some solid cards. And in most green-black decks, again, if you're just ignoring all the green synergies, you're just going to have good, solid green-black cards. Green-red is a deck that I've drafted much more in this past week than I would have expected to. I, in fact, I drafted it for my second draft of the Arena Open this weekend. It's sort of got the same Just Play the Good Cards vibe as the last two decks I was talking about. But it does have a bit of a synergy component that I'll get to in a second. So, first of all, the gold cards. Strider, Ranger of the North. It's the 4-mana 4-4 four four that has the landfall ability to pump something. Friendly Rivalry. It's a really good uh, removal spell is the red-green instant target creature you control and a legend you control team up to bite something. So these are like solid rewards for being in the colors on their own. But there is an actual synergy component to this deck. And for once in Red Green's life, the Red Green 4 Power Matter thing actually matters with the card War Beast of Gorgoroth. So this is the 5 mana, 4 and a red, 5, 4, that when it or another creature you control with power 4 or greater dies, you amass 2. I think this is an underrated card in general. I think you should just be playing this card in most of your red decks that have, you know, 3, 4, 5, 4 power creatures, because, you know, this does trigger itself, so it doesn't need 2 too much. But in red-green, I'm really happy to play multiples of this. If you look on 17 lands and filter by archetype data this is the second most winning common for red green just below smite the deathless and th the reason this card is quite good is it solves for one of the problems that a, a red green monsters deck generally has where you tap out and you cast a four or five mana spell that you hope to untap and attack with it but your opponent just has a removal spell a, th a two or three mana removal spell and you're like oh crap well I did a lot of work for not that much and they got a mana advantage because they cast like a claim the pressure on my big creature well they can't really do that here. I mean, they can, but it'll give them quite a bit of pain. They have to kill this before they kill any of your other four power creatures. Generally, I've had spots where my opponent tanks and thinks for a long time, and they eventually kill my war beast. <laughs> or, like, spend their turn, kill my war beast, and go, all right, I mean, I'm left with the 2-2. And the reason it's so great is because it curves so naturally into what Red Green wants to be doing. So Red Green's general game plan, um, if it had its way every single game, it would just play a most Pathfinder, the two mana green mana dork on turn two, and just curve it into a four power creature. Stuff like Bag End Porter, Strider, Duendane Rangers, which is the four mana four four uncommon with the landfall ability. Uh, if you don't have a ring bearer, the ring tempts you. Ideally, your four drop has four toughness, uh, four power and four toughness, like Relentless for Hiram, which is the four mana. 3-4 that ETB is tempts you. I think this card is notably worse than Bag End Porter, Strider, or the Rangers in this deck because there's just, you know, your opponents can trade up with this card or, you know, they can trade their 2-drop or 3-drop with their Hiram. 4 Toughness is a lot more difficult to deal with even in double blocks. Um, and also in Red Green, you're not tempting all of that much. The Hiram go does go down in value a little bit. But anyways, if your goal is just play a Rose Pathfinder or just play a 4-mana four 4-4 four four as soon as you can and then you curve it into the War Beast, well... The bag end porter, let's say that attacks and it's a 5-5. Five five. Well, often they'll have like a 2-2 a two two and a 3-3 three three lying around to double block. And you're like, okay, well, that's not that great for me. I, I guess the 2-3-3 three, three, two, three, three is probably better if you're attacking for 5, right? And you're like, well, I don't really want to attack my 5-5 five five into their 2-3-3s three because three that's a bad exchange. It's not that bad of an exchange if you attack in, you have a war beast on the battlefield, you you kill a 3-3 three three and you get a 2-2 two two out, uh, out of the deal, right? And that can happen just multiple times. Your opponent's going to be forced into awkward situations. So... This is an actual theme of the deck. Don't overlook it. Also, just want to point out a cool little interaction. Uh, Many Partings and Improvised Club. Many Partings is the uh, sorcerer that goes and gets a land and makes a food. Club is the two mana red instant that you can sacrifice a creature or artifact to deal four to any target. So it's just nice that you can cast your partings early, have the food lying around. Not a lot of other colors get a nice natural curve of having improvised club on pretty early without having to sack a creature. So just something that uh, I've noticed improvised club is a card that you should prioritize if you've got many partings in red green. And the last decks I want to talk about here are blue white and green white. I'm not going to do a deep dive on it, just some words on them. Generally, I end up in blue white or green white when they're open. <laughs> it's really the long and short of it. Green white, especially if it's open, you can get really hooked up. Like Frodo, the the golden common, the one three ring bearer that tempts you every time a legend enters, and your opponent has to block it if it's the ring bearer. That card's great. That card is fantastic. Really, really good. Green white suffers in general because its synergies at common don't work. Like the food synergies just aren't particularly good. But if you get some Frodo's passed to you, or, uh, you know, Samwise or Aragorn at rare, like these are some golden co gold cards that you might get passed to you because you have a lot of times where your pod 
they are just so ravenous and getting those red and black cards that they will ignore the green, white, or the blue, white, gold cards. See, and so when you're drafting green, white, or blue, white, it's really a card quality deck. Like, I don't think you should try to make the food stuff work. Even if it's really open, you're getting all the cards for the food deck. Same as blue, white. Like, blue, white's draw two theme. Don't worry about it too much. I mean, you can put Prince and Heal in your deck. Like, that card's good. It's the 2-2 two, two that makes a 1-1 one, one every time you uh, draw your second card. But you shouldn't try to enable it. Like, the ring is going to enable that by itself. You don't need to put stuff like the 2-3 looter, right? The captain that loots. Like, that card's just not good. Like, I, I, this is just the short way of saying don't put bad cards in your deck to make your good cards better. But it's especially true for blue-white and for green-white because when they are open enough for me to be in those decks, I just happen to get a bunch of good blue and white or uh, green and white cards. It, it means that I don't have to be scrounging to have a good deck by having some weird synergies. I'm just going to get enough good cards. And just to close out here, I have a few notable cards, maybe underrated, maybe one or two overrated, but just some cards I have some thoughts on. So the first one here is Horses of Brunin. This is the five mana, three blue, blue sorcery at Uncommon. Return up to two target creatures to their owner's hand. Scry one, the ring tempts you. Uh, quite an underrated card, I would say. This card is great in this format. There's a lot of formats where this type of card is not particularly good because, you know, you want to be in a, a, a tempo deck, an aggro deck to really make use of bounce two things because if you're just bouncing two things as a control deck well it's like you're not really getting anywhere as an aggro deck you can like play a two play a three cast this on five start bashing but since there are so many tokens in the set uh there's like one one tokens there's a mass tokens killing one of those things and bouncing like a four drop plus scrying plus the ring tempting you that all balances out to this being a good card this is just a card you should put in your blue decks you should take pretty highly. It's one of Blue's best uncommons. Council's Deliberations. This is one in a blue for an instant. And it says draw a card. And then whenever you scry, if you control an island, you can exile it from your grave. And if you do draw a card, this is a funny little card because it's obviously a plant for the blue green deck that isn't much a deck. But you can still play this card because it's a powerful card, right? If you get make this two mana draw a card and draw another card just at some point, like two mana draw two, that's good. You can play it if you have some combination of Hithlane Knots, which is the two mana tap something, scry one, draw a card, or uh, Arwen's Gift, which is scry two, draw two. Like, those are the two main cards you're going to have that uh, scry that you'll just naturally put in your deck. Like, in your blue red deck, you're going to be playing both those cards. So, if you have this, like, little package of scry, um, you can put this card in your deck, but you do want, like, six or so cards to be able to trigger it. Um, but just just know, it's not a blue green gold card, it's just a card that requires a bit of a package to be able to play it. Elrond, Lord of Rivendale, this is a 3 mana 3-2, three, 2 in two blue at Uncommon. When it, it or another creature enters the battlefield, you scry one, and if it's the second time this ability resolves this turn, the ring tempts you. I believe this card is quite overrated, because people take it very, very highly, and it's not all that much better than like the common 3-2 uh, flash scry one. I would generally not play this card just in general in my blue decks unless I have the cards that work with it and the cards that work with it are cards that make multiple bodies so stuff like Rally at the Hornburg stuff like Protector of Gondor the the four mana uh three three in white like if this tempts you off of one card that's when you can start considering it so it's kind of a blue red or a blue white card if you've got say three rallies or three protectors and just wanted to point it out as not just a card you should put in your deck it is more of a all right, this is one of my 2023 playables because I have these other cards. Dreadful as the Storm. This is the two and a blue instant. Target creature has base power and toughness 5-5 five, five until on a turn. The rain tempts you. So this card is worse than the variants that draw a card. But there's a lot of room between Suit Up or Majestic Metamorphosis and a bad card. And this card's not bad. This is a card I'm happy to play usually just the first copy of in most of my blue decks. But the second copy can get there if you have enough amass stuff, right? Because this plays very well on amass creatures. It just gives them plus five, plus five, because they're zero zeros with counters on them. It's quite good in red-blue, uh, because in red-blue, you have a bunch of small creatures. You also care about tempting. Like I mentioned, you can get to the fourth level of the ring quite often in red-blue. And you also have, like, a good number of amass creatures in red-blue, too. A good example of where this card really shines, you know, on turn three, you can cast out as a trick. The ring tempts you, you win the combat, whatever. But... Later in the game, turn six, you're attacking with a few things. Your 1-1 your one, one amass token gets through, and you cast Dreadful as the Storm. It's now a 6-6 six, six unblocked, and maybe you even tapped into the fourth level at that point. So that's like nine damage. So this card not only is just fine early on, like it's, it's an okay trick, a little bit overcosted, but the ring tempting you makes up for that. 
but then it can just deal massive amounts of damage on a flyer, on an amass token or something. So it's just good early, good late. The last card I want to talk about is the Black Breath. This is the two and a black sorcery. Creatures of your opponent's control gets negative one, negative one until on a turn the ring tempts you. I had a lot of questions about this card this week. A lot of people coming to my Twitch chat asking, hey, like, should I play this card? It seems pretty good. There's a lot of X ones running around. I usually can find a target for it. I had been telling people, no, I don't think you should play this card. But then I gave it a spin, and I also looked at some of the stats in 17 lands, and I, I was basically categorizing it as bad 23rd card when you really need it. Now I think it's closer to, like, okay 18th to 23rd card. I think there are just enough times when you can clean up a rally at the Hornburg, and yes, it's not going to be, you're not up on mana there, but you are up attempt, so that kind of, like, offsets that a little bit. And there are just enough times when your opponent casts two rallies, or just has randomly has three X ones and you feel great about this card or you know your opponent plays uh, it's, it's a buyout against the uh, Horn of Gondor right if your if your opponent happens to have the or Anduril right two of the most busted rares not that that really weighs in on how much you should play the card you should look at how much this lines up against the commons and the uncommons rather than the rares but it lines up well enough basically so yeah you can play a copy of Black Breath and not feel too bad about it and that's it we're gonna pack it up from there thank you for watching thank you for listening like I mentioned before we will have the gameplay episode coming to you soon so stay tuned for that Hope everybody's enjoying this format, by the way. I, uh, I've i really been pleasantly surprised. I didn't expect to love this format as much as I do, but as I play more and more, the gameplay has been really deep. The draft, you know, maybe is not the most exciting out of any set, but I, I have found this set been one that's really kept my attention and has gone better as it's gone on, honestly, as I've understood more. And usually that happens. When you understand more, you start to enjoy the format. Anyways, thank you for watching and listening. We'll see you next time.